Ever since human beings started migrating around the world, we have left a trail of destruction in our wake. And despite having potentially millions of victims over the past hundred thousand years or so, for some reason, one very weird animal has come to be synonymous with our very bad habit of making things go extinct. The dodo bird. Mm -hmm. uh, dodos were native to the tiny, isolated island of Mauritius, and thanks to their lack of natural predators, lack of fear of humans, inability to fly, and their big, enticingly meaty size, it was over for those dodos within less than 100 years of their first contact with hungry European sailors. Yeah, uh, humans, of course, initially blamed the dodo for its own demise. Victim it's, blaming. It's so dumb looking, how yeah. could you not beat it to death with a giant stick? I had to do it. Uh, if only the dodo hadn't been so fat and so stupid, it might still be around. Who knows? Luckily, we've gotten a bit better at recognizing what a mess we've made of this planet through our carelessness and excess. And, you know, on the good side of the dodo bird, it was so dumb looking that people are actually aware of it because uh, it became a staple in many cartoons uh, just less than 100 years after real, it was extinct. Yeah, probably the most popular extinct animal. Yeah, they're like, look at that idiot. What a character. I actually know the T-Rex would be way more popular. But, but we didn't was, do that. That was too far, far, far behind. We didn't do that. Them, that know? was space mm -hmm. that did that. But uh, unfortunately, while we can try our best to stop even more species from going extinct, we can't change the past. We can't bring the dodo back. Or can we? Can we? Well, here's Motherboard. The phrase dead as a dodo may be, well, dead as a dodo, if a recently founded de-extinction company has its way. Colossal Biosciences, founded in 2021 by entrepreneur Ben Lamb and Harvard geneticist George Church, announced on Tuesday that it plans to resurrect and rewild the dodo, the iconic flightless bird that has become a powerful symbol of extinction after it was rapidly wiped out as a result of human interferences on its native island of Mauritius. Colossal is already working on efforts to de-extinct the woolly mammoth and thylacine, aka the Tasmanian tiger, and reintroduce them to wild habitats. In the process, the company hopes to pioneer new technologies with applications in conservation biology and human healthcare, to name a few. They add that on at the end to be like, well, this is going to benefit everyone. Yeah. I also feel like they went from like woolly mammoth and the, the public perception is like, okay, those are really big. Can we, can we figure out something else? All right. Uh, the, the Tasmanian tiger. Okay. Well, a little less. How about we do the harmless dodo? Yeah. Thing is, uh, bringing back the, the woolly mammoth is like, Mu at least as of now, much more feasible than bringing back the dodo. Like, they literally don't know how to, like, do this with birds because it involves, like, having to insert an embryo into a shell. And they're yeah. like, uh, I don't know. Uh, the, <laughs> the only thing that would be really cool is if they do bring it back, they have to immediately let a European beat it to death yeah. and cause it to go extinct again. As is tradition. Yes. Now, as you might guess, bringing back the dodo, it, it's not going to be easy. In fact, despite having fully sequenced dodo DNA, what they'll be creating if this all goes to plan still won't be a dodo, but rather what they call a proxy species. Uh, it looks like the dodo, but it won't actually be a dodo. Uh, they've got to compare the dodo's genome to various other relatives, some of which are also extinct, to figure out which genes actually made a dodo look like a dodo. And then they've got to figure out a way to get a dodo embryo into an egg and get it to hatch. So, you know, um, I'm sure they're getting around to it, but right now it seems difficult. They also really only have like a few specimens in kind of poor condition and like paintings from 500 years ago to go off of. Like they don't have a perfectly preserved like taxidermy dodo to be like, that's what this should look like. They do not need to go anywhere near that. They need to look at the like 1940s Looney Tunes yeah. where the dodo has a, a umbrella uh, sticking out of its head and a big dumb snout and everything. Can we do a little gene editing to make a rabbit that stands on two feet and gets up to mischief? And has Just a Brooklyn crank, accent. Crank up that mischief gene. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it cross-dresses, too. Yeah. It's very progressive for And its it looks time. great when it does. Yes, it does. Anyway, even if they manage to successfully create something that seems just like a dodo or a Tasmanian tiger or a mammoth, another problem emerges. Just what the hell do you do with it? Uh, for the dodo, the end goal is to reestablish them on Mauritius, but the Mauritius of today is a lot different than the Mauritius of 500 years ago. They will need to basically eliminate every invasive species on the entire island, which is not easily done. Australia has been trying for a long time. They lost a war against emus. Anyway, it's certainly a noble goal, but it, it raises the question of whether this is maybe the best use of all this money and all these resources when we have more pressing matters 
Yeah, especially facing our own uh, potential extinction as well. Like, we're going to bring these animals back just for their them to go extinct again. I mean, it would be the ultimate irony if uh, we managed to make the dodo outlive humanity. They, yeah, that would be... the last laugh. That would be a great fate. But, like, the woolly mammoth is just like, we have live uh, animals that aren't extinct that are right on the cusp because of climate change, yeah. and you want to bring back the woolly mammoth. Yeah, literally bringing back a, like, ice animal at a time when existing, like, cold weather animals are uh, not in a good position since their habitats are rapidly shrinking. The polar bears are so <laughs> hard to spot when they're floating around the ocean on top of those tiny glaciers that break off. We need a, an animal that's giant and a darker color so you can spot them easier. Yeah. But yet they are still floating around in the ocean because... Well, the glaciers are melting. In fact, I believe one just collapsed that was like the size of London or something. So that's happening. Great. On the other hand, look back to the uh, whole reviving species that are dead. If it works out, this technology could then be used to help out species that are still around but are in serious trouble. And by saying they're bringing back the dodo and the mammoth and the thylacine, they're probably going to raise a lot more money than if they simply marketed the more practical uses of this technology. Still, it seems like a long shot, but uh, best of luck to them. Yeah, I mean, like, listen, would it be cool to see these animals? Absolutely. Is it worth the effort and the money going into it? Almost certainly not, but fuck it. So much of, of this, this is like, well, I, I know that they have to tack on some kind of like human benefit on anything to get funding for it, but so much of it is just... Like, okay, yeah, you've uh, stopped aging by like 10 years in humans, um, but the world is going to be uh, uninhabitable by 2070 or whatever. So mm -hmm. what's the point? I get to see more of the apocalypse. I mean, yeah, you are going to get a front seat to it depending on where you live because uh, climate migration is going to be something that is uh, very serious over the next 30 years. It's all very exciting. But uh, yeah, the real these dodos are in for a real uh, fish out of water moment. Yeah, if they weren't saying, oh, Whoa. my God, when they were brought back, uh, you know, uh, decades ago, certainly now they'll be like, why? Yeah. Send us back. Please kill me. <laughs> Send us back into oblivion. <laughs> but moving on now to the part of the show where we talk about AI, mm. because like NFTs last year, the AI news does not stop. And unlike with NFTs, we're not sure it will ever stop. Mm. It's just going to keep on going. Hopefully it at least slows down, though, at some point, because we are now fighting the AI war on three fronts. Visual in the form of AI image generators, textual in the form of GPT, and audio in the form of voice deepfakes, which are in the news this week for a very predictable reason. Mm -hmm. Here's Motherboard. It was only a matter of time before the wave of artificial intelligence generated voice startups became a plaything of internet trolls. On Monday, Eleven Labs, founded by ex-Google and Palantir staffers, said it had found an increasing number of voice cloning misuse cases during its recently launched beta. Eleven Labs didn't point to any particular instances of abuse, but Motherboard found 4chan members appear to have used the product to generate voices that sound like Joe Rogan, Ben Shapiro, and Emma Watson to spew racist and other sorts of material. Eleven Labs said it's exploring more safeguards around its technology. Are they sure that the things that were <laughs> they came up with were actually uh, altered voice things and not just the ramblings of Ben Shapiro and Joe Rogan? I mean, that's the thing. Some of these people are beyond parody already. Seems like a waste of your time as a troll. Emma Watson is just a a forever 4chan target because they think she's hot. So yeah, I, yeah. that one makes sense. But uh, the Joe Rogan and Ben Shapiro ones are just like, guys, you don't really have to work too hard here. Yeah. But anyway, yeah, when you're developing new technology, your first question really should always be, what will the absolute worst people on the internet do with this? We all saw how quickly Tay turned into a Nazi and how quickly deepfake shifted from fun little Nicolas Cage edits to non-consensual pornography. And yet here we are again. Yeah. Uh, specific examples from this little thing include uh, Emma Watson reading Hitler's Mein Kampf, Ben Shapiro making racist remarks about AOC. Again, don't need okay. AI for that. And R Rick Sanchez talking about beating his wife to death, which is terrible, but at least topical. Life imitates art. Um, in this case, the art is produced by AI, uh, but uh, the AI, I guess, knew something. But yeah, all sorts of racist, homophobic, transphobic, and violent audio clips using famous voices were posted to 4chan. Yeah, Eleven Labs, the makers of this tool, publicly responded to all this new attention by saying they do have some sort of system in place for being able to trace audio clips back to specific users, but they're exploring other ideas up to and including manually verifying each voice cloning request Though that seems pretty damn impractical. 
Uh, sorry, guys, but you opened Pandora's box here, and it, it doesn't seem like there's a whole lot of ways to ensure that your abuse-friendly product isn't abused. This is just the world we live in now. Yeah, like, you did it. And, and anyone looking at what you were doing could have told you that this was going to happen. And in a lot of cases, especially with social media uh, companies, they really do have to... The people in charge of where funding goes for development in this, they have to see what the worst case scenario is because despite the people making the product telling them yeah. that it's going to be used for very bad reasons, they'll go, all right, well, let's just see how long it takes. That's true. It doesn't take very long, though. But moving on now to text generating AI. OpenAI, the makers of ChatGPT, seems to have realized that they should probably do something to at least try and combat all the academic dishonesty that their academic dishonesty generator is creating. So, like many other third parties are also doing, OpenAI has launched a tool that aims to detect whether text is AI generated or not. More specifically, it takes a minimum of 1,000 characters, which is approximately 150 to 250 words, and gives a likelihood score that the text was generated by AI. So it sounds like great news for teachers who suddenly now have to be way more vigilant about academic dishonesty, except of course, it is not that simple. OpenAI straight up admits in their press release that this tool is not fully reliable and says that in their own evaluations, it correctly identifies AI written text 26% of the time and incorrectly labels human written text as AI written 9% of the time. They stress that it should not be used as a primary decision making tool, but there are definitely going to be teachers accusing totally innocent students of AI plagiarism while the actual cheaters are getting away with it. Yeah, with those uh, success rates, this thing is fucking useless. Yeah. This is, uh, thank you very much, OpenAI, but um, yeah, no. This Thanks for nothing. This doesn't solve the problem that you created, mm -hmm. but um, whatever. So yeah, clearly this is just going to be a cat and mouse game forever as technology improves and improves. So education is really just going to have to shift its emphasis away from take-home essays towards other modes of evaluating students' understanding of topics. Oral! Oral. We need to bring back oral. It's still just sort of insane how quickly things have changed, though. It's, it's understandable that teachers who have been teaching for a long time and are kind of set in their ways would have a very tough time adjusting to this. I feel bad for those teachers. And th these are the, the same educators. Do I look like I know what a GPT is? Imagine like being a teacher and working through the pandemic. Yeah. And then the, li the, the light at the end of the tunnel is your job getting uh, much harder in a completely new and fascinating way. Yeah. Um, so yeah, <laughs> there's, uh, there's really, there's no going back now. They'll just have to adjust accordingly. It is what it is. Yeah. Now, okay, teachers are, uh, you know, they're uh, babysitters. They're uh, potential security guards that put their lives on the line. And they earn a healthy, uh, you know, consummate salary. For, yeah. Do, no, oh, I'm getting word that they do not. That's correct. But now they have to add a data analyst on top of this. Yeah. And they have to be better than computers. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, unsurprisingly, there was an article uh, the last two weeks about a teacher who... Uh, quit and started working at Costco and said it was the best decision that she's ever made. Oh my God, I can't imagine. Yeah. Like, more money, more benefits, and no stress. Everyone I see working at Costco seems like they are very happy. They're always giving me thumbs up. Yeah. <laughs> Either that's a warning sign or they're actually doing okay. Just uh, don't look up when you're, uh, when you're in Costco. It's, uh... Yeah, you'll get vertigo. It's like reverse vertigo. Oh God. Yeah. Like the void is calling and it's up. <laughs> You're going to be buried under an absolute mountain of retail products. If, uh -huh. if this, uh, if this the earthquake hits, under. I'm yeah. dying in the Costco. Yeah. Uh, but it's not just writing in school that's being completely disrupted by ChatGPT. It's also writing as an actual career skill because ChatGPT is making entry level writing jobs obsolete. And companies don't care if the writing that they're publishing is AI generated. And in fact, they prefer it <laughs> because ChatGPT doesn't need a salary and it doesn't need health insurance. Of course, there are still issues of quality, as we've seen with CNET's AI generated articles, which have been filled with inaccuracies and downright plagiarism from their own uh, other outlets, which yeah. is funny. But for clickbait junk that drives ad sales, who gives a shit? Yeah. And while the evergreen sort of explainer articles that CNET is mostly writing with this AI might not exactly fit the definition of clickbait, the undisputed king of clickbait, BuzzFeed, has entered the ring. They are now adding AI to their arsenal, and they're doing so in honestly kind of a brilliant way. Yeah. Gotta admit. At launch, they're not even going to be using it on the BuzzFeed news side of things. Good. Thank God. Yeah. 
And that, yeah, that is good. Probably not for long. I. They need to spin that off even further yeah. because the name is so toxic now. It really is. It, it makes the a very good newsroom seem uh, untrustworthy because of the name. Yeah, it's a problem. Yes. Um, but yeah, for now, it looks like it's mainly just going to be used for BuzzFeed's original bread and butter, those quizzes. Yeah, like, the, great. You, the quizzes and then being like, 25 things only a person from Schenectady, New York would understand. Like, those kind of things yeah, are... Sure. Give it to Have the AI. Have an AI write that. Because whoever's... The human that was writing that is, uh, probably has some mental trauma now. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, look, they'll be using a custom build of GPT-3 to basically take people's quiz responses and then have the AI spit something out, like in this example slide. This quiz will write a rom-com about you in less than 30 seconds. It's literally just an AI-enhanced Mad Libs for people who don't know what GPT is and wouldn't know how to find it to use themselves. So, I mean, it's kind of brilliant, probably a great idea to bring in site traffic, but it's still probably going to eventually lead to actual human writers losing their jobs. Um, in addition to you noticing the guardrails last week, I found a very funny guardrail this week uh, where I typed in, uh, hey, chat GPT, uh, based on the market this week, what stocks should I invest in? Ooh. And it literally, I'm not joking, you can probably type it in yourself. This is not financial advice. It said that and do your own research. Oh, shit. It said... We cannot give, the, the stock market is currently trending higher. We cannot yeah. give financial advice, and we think it's best that you do your own research before investing in any uh, yeah. anything like that. I mean, that's uh, yeah, not financial advice. But like two but, weeks ago, they would have been like, yeah, short Tesla or something like that, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it is uh, it is interesting. It's got a lot of guardrails. The old chat GPT or the old GPT-3, uh, less guardrails, more potential for funny stuff, but also more potential for uh, bad, misleading, abusive stuff. Uh, like the internet uh, as a whole. Yeah. More guardrails means, uh, you know, some things are harmed, but others, like, yeah. It's, a, it's a weird balancing act. We constantly have to play with how bad it's going to affect society. Right. Yeah. And it just seems mostly like everything's bad. <laughs> it's all going to affect society negatively. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, there's still plenty of jobs that are safe from being replaced by AI for now. Uh, for example, despite ChatGPT doing all right on the bar exam, AI won't be replacing human lawyers in the courtroom anytime soon. Though recently that wasn't looking 100% certain. Um, the website Do Not Pay has been around for a while, and it seems mostly pretty useful for handling really basic legal tasks like disputing parking tickets through automation via uh, GPT. Lawyers are expensive and do not pay apparently does a decent job at saving people money on the really simple stuff. Though you're still definitely better off hiring a lawyer for anything important. <laughs> Please yeah. understand. Mm -hmm. So anyway, do not pay's founder recently got the idea that his legal chatbot is so useful and so foolproof that he was going to try something groundbreaking. Here's an article uh, last month uh, in New Scientist. An artificial intelligence is set to advise a defendant in court for the first time ever. The AI will run on a smartphone and listen to all speech in the courtroom in February before instructing the defendant on what to say via an earpiece. The location of the court and the name of the defendant are being kept under wraps by Do Not Pay, the company that created the AI. But it is understood that the defendant is charged with speeding and that they will say only what Do Not Pay's tools tells them to via an earbud. The case is being considered as a test by the company, which has agreed to pay any fines should they be imposed, says the firm's founder, Joshua Browder. Using a smartphone or computer connected to an in-ear device in court would be illegal in most countries, but Do Not Pay has found a location where this setup can be classed as a hearing aid and therefore allowed, says Browder. Quote, it's technically within the rules, but I don't think it's in the spirit of the rules, he says. <laughs> so yeah, we've got ourselves a real-life Air Bud situation on our hands here. <laughs> Nothing in the rule book that says you can't have an AI lawyer in your Apple earbud. At Air Bud, earbud, it, yeah. it's all the same. Um, or at least we did, we had a Airbud situation on our hands until multiple legal jurisdictions made it very clear to Mr. Browder that this plan was definitely illegal in multiple ways and could result in him being sent to jail for six months if he tried it Chad and they GPT, figured it out. Write a response to these guys who tell me that this is illegal. <laughs> um, as Browder told a human BuzzFeed reporter, the problem was that I was tweeting all this out. I even tweeted out the exact date the trial was happening. Then the lawyers began systematically phoning up every major state bar association to try and stop us. They were really hating on us. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. They were self-defense. You are, you are threatening. Like this is this is the interesting thing. Like, 
uh, careers that actually do require like. Uh, certifications and uh, graduate degrees and stuff like these people have the means to uh, fight back against AI yeah. coming into their space and they are going to do so. On the other hand, like I love the AI chasing down uh, like speeding tickets or, or traffic citations thing because a lot of those companies just keep moving the date automatically anyway yeah. until the, the officer doesn't show up. Yeah. So like that it, you know, yeah, sure. Anyways, there's a great section uh, about this uh, from Gizmodo's reporting. Quote, I didn't really think that the courts and lawyers would be so angered because I thought it was just a traffic ticket case. And it's not the Supreme Court, Browder said, which is an odd choice of words, considering that the same guy once tweeted that his company would pay $1 million to anyone willing to use Do Not Pay's AI legal advisor in front of the U.S. Supreme Court. But I digress. <laughs> Quote, I also underestimated how much lawyers would spend their time and resources trying to stop this, Browder added. Yet you'd think it would be obvious that lawyers are, by definition, litigious. Yeah. So, yeah, um, reiterating what you said, it's they have the time and the uh, resources built in to, yeah. to combat this. This, is, this. this one's for fun. I'm still, I, I still think, you know, I hate this in general, but like I've had stories from friends who are just like they had an issue with like their landlord. And they they showed up to court, and both lawyers knew each other, and were just like hanging out, like yeah, yeah, we'll we'll figure this out. And yeah, I mean, uh, it, it's all just there is a lot procedural. Of, there's a lot of issues with this. Um, yeah, the, I mean, depending on where you are, especially the legal community can be quite small. Um, yeah. That's that doesn't necessarily mean there's anything nefarious happening. But sure, uh, it's just an odd uh, visual. But what this is going to get used for, definitely. Uh, the test case, unfortunately, for this is going to be public defenders. Uh, They're gonna like, no, I mean, we got the we got the robot public defender. Don't worry. Maybe. And the sad thing would be is if it did a better job. Um, I don't know. I doubt it. Like, there's there's so many like idiosyncrasies. Like, law is really fucking hard, as you might imagine. It's yeah. it's very difficult to become a lawyer. Um, I'm looking, I'm just, I would imagine, yeah, a public defender, like a criminal case, an AI, I could see it doing a, a, I guess an, a passable job, but like, I'm saying I'm looking forward in like the d dystopian sense of what America's legal system will use this for before anything else. Like you just have an AI lawyer and an AI judge. Yeah. Just, <laughs> just burning through all, all yeah, the cases. Your no case problem. is just automated within like two seconds. Yeah. Like, just, all right. And you're guilty. The most dystopian thing you can think of is you know, if we don't get to that point, then hey, great job, everyone. This, and then you end up with uh, real life, like Judge Dredd. Who yeah, has no, I, like an AI on his gun. It's just like it's like a all it's right, like guilty. A, yeah, it's just, it's just a conveyor belt. <laughs> yeah. Welcome to America. Yeah, damn. Yeah. Anyways, we've got plenty more news to cover today. But first, this episode is sponsored by Mudwater. Mm. Sounds kind of gross, but it's not. It's good. Mudwater is a coffee alternative with four adaptogenic mushrooms and Ayurvedic herbs. With only a fraction of caffeine as a cup of coffee, you get energy without the anxiety, jitters, or crash of coffee. Mudwater leans on mushrooms in their blend of matcha and their blend of chai for sustained energy. Each ingredient was added for a purpose. Lion's mane, that's a mushroom for alertness. Cordyceps to help support physical performance. Chaga and reishi to support your immune system. Turmeric for soreness and cinnamon for antioxidants. I uh, I like the chai flavor. I like to add, uh, they, they also sell this coconut milk powder mm. with MCT oil in it. I add a little bit of sugar. It's damn good. And they got this stirring stick. It's uh, very, very, very powerful. Yeah, I mean, It'll mix that thing up real good. I love coffee, but uh, after my seventh or eighth cup, I do get a little bit jittery. So it's yeah. been nice to kind of try to find an alternative. It's actually, uh, yeah. It, my my favorite thing is that I don't have just like stomach, like ass, massive acid reflux <laughs> after having uh, a cup of coffee on on an empty stomach, which is a stupid thing I do all the time. <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, mud is 100% USDA organic, non-GMO, gluten-free, vegan, and kosher certified. Mudwater donates monthly to leading psychedelic research centers as Mudwater believes the country is in a mental health epidemic and sees psychedelics as a useful tool for individuals with depression, PTSD, anxiety, and other mental health problems. Hey, we both love them, don't we, folks? We do. Go to uh, <laughs> mudwtr.com slash newsday to support the show and use code newsday for 15% off. That is M-U-D-W-T-R, mudwater.com slash newsday for 15% off with code newsday. There's the acid reflux. Uh, back to the news mm, now. Is that a Arabica blend? Mm. 
For several years now, ransomware has been a huge thorn in the side of companies and organizations around the world, from large to small, who suddenly find their access to their entire computer networks held hostage unless they pay some exorbitant cryptocurrency fee. One ransomware gang that's been quite prolific is known as Hive, and their victims have included a Costa Rican public health agency, Germany's biggest tech retail chain, a hospital network in Ohio, one of Indonesia's largest gas suppliers, an entire town in Spain, and the Central Bank of Zambia. And in that last case, Zambia's Central Bank, they refused to pay, and instead they sent the hackers a dick pic and a message reading, suck this dick and stop blocking banking networks, which is pretty cool. Yeah, I, I mean, like that's, that. that's definitely a cool way to go about it. Uh, anyways, as you might hope, all of these attacks put Hive firmly in the crosshairs of various international law enforcement agencies, and the FBI announced last week that, ladies and gentlemen, they got him. Here's Gizmodo. In one of the FBI's most sophisticated cybercrime operations to date, agents infiltrated and spent approximately six months embedded in a prominent ransomware gang's network, Justice Department officials announced Thursday. That gang, known as Hive, was disrupted earlier this week when agents seized its server infrastructure and also took down its website. Speaking Thursday, Attorney General Merrick Garland characterized Hive as, quote, an international ransomware network responsible for extorting and attempting to extort hundreds of millions of dollars from victims in the United States and around the world. So somehow the FBI, with assistance from Europol, managed to infiltrate Hive's own network in July of last year. And for about seven months, they just sort of lurked on there and gained access to Hive's decryption keys. And then they would provide those keys to Hive's victims whenever a new attack went down. Uh, all in all, they said they stopped more than $130 million in ransomware payments by providing 300 keys to victims actively under attack and another 1,000 keys to previous victims. Is that how Zambia was able to tell them to fuck off? Uh, it would be interesting if that was the case. It would be cool if they were... Suck this dick. We already have the key, you moron. Because it, the FBI and the CIA, they're like, you know what really bothers them? is when you're a dick to them and you send them pictures of cocks. Yeah. So that's the best tactic. And... Uh, I just think it's funny that if they were doing this and they like all these companies just had the confidence to tell them to fuck off yeah. is pretty satisfying. Kiss my ass. So in Merrick Garland's announcement, he said, we hide, we watch as they proceed with their attacks, we discover the keys, and we deliver the keys to the victims so that they can decrypt their systems and don't have to pay the ransom. Finally, we take down the infrastructure. We take down the servers that power Hive's ability to go ahead. We can only do that once we're able to locate where the servers are. And that's what we were able to do only very recently. And we resolved the matter last night. So yeah, unfortunately, there weren't any arrests announced or even any names, but even if they know who was running Hive, they most likely live somewhere like pff, Russia that doesn't extradite to the U.S. Regardless, still good news. But speaking of getting in trouble with the law, we've recently covered uh, how a lot of healthcare websites share users' personal data with Facebook and Google, which seems like it should be illegal. And fortunately, at least in one case so far, the government seems to agree. Here's the New York Times. Millions of Americans have used GoodRx, a drug discount app, to search for lower prices on prescriptions like antidepressants, HIV medications, and treatments for sexually transmitted diseases at their local drugstores. But U.S. regulators say the app's coupons and convenience came at a high cost for users. Wrongful disclosure of their intimate health information. On Wednesday, the Federal Trade Commission accused the app's developer, GoodRx Holdings, of sharing sensitive personal data on millions of users' prescription medications and illnesses with companies like Facebook and Google without authorization. The FTC's case against GoodRx could upend widespread user profiling and ad targeted practices in the multi billion dollar digital health industry, and it puts companies on notice that regulators intend to curb the nearly unfettered trade in consumers' health details. Good. Get their asses. Does Mark Cuban's company do this? Because I've only heard good things about that, and I would hate for that to be bad. But I, I, so far, I've only heard great things. I mean, they probably do. I, I would love it if they didn't. But all these companies, literally, they're just like, hey, Face we, yeah. Facebook said to embed this like tracking pixel in, in every website, and so let's do it. And I'm just not going to consult the law or uh, think for a second about whether the stuff, the data that we are collecting on our healthcare website might not be the thing that uh, is... Uh, good to track or even legal to track. Just uh, just fucking do it. Yeah. Anyway, the FTC is seeking to fine GoodRx $1.5 million. Oh no, what will they do? And also permanently ban them from sharing users' health information for advertising purposes. Well, there's the good part. Sounds like they're getting off pretty easy considering they were telling Facebook whether people were on birth control, erectile dysfunction drugs, or had even just looked up info about sexually transmitted diseases. That info was then basically permanently tied to users' ad profiles, which 
They follow you around everywhere. They're tied to device IDs and IP addresses. Um, so not great. Interestingly, the way GoodRx collected and shared this information was the same as all the other examples that we've covered previously, tracking pixels from Meta, Google, and other companies. So hopefully the FTC also pursues the many other companies who've done this exact same thing. Yeah. It's, uh, you got your caseload ready to go. Yeah. Good. And on, on the on the way in, uh, I heard I didn't look into it in great detail, but apparently Biden administration going to be focusing on junk fees, which is like all the stupid Good. add on fees that everyone from concert tickets, airlines, yeah. rental cars, all that shit. Like, what is this? Why are these? Here? It doesn't seem Get like it should be legal. And in pretty much every other country, it's not. Yeah. So you can't just add on bullshit fucking uh, prices like. I don't use Uber Eats uh, nearly as much anymore, but it's like astounding <laughs> how much they fucking like tack on uh, to shit like at the last second. Or like if you're booking a place through like uh, Airbnb, you're like, oh, it's like a hundred dollars a night, and you get to the end and you're paying like more than twice what you were originally pitched. The bare minimum. Like, fuck you. Airbnb recently did the bare minimum, which is like you can click the button to be like show the final price yeah. for Christ's sake, because that's the thing is it's just like oh. Hundred dollars for this cabin plus eight hundred dollars plus a two hundred dollar per day like maid fee. It's and like, and also off. you have to clean the whole place. Yeah, uh, insane. Yeah, like I bought a, a relatively small venue, the Observatory in Santa Ana. Yeah, I bought tickets to a show next month. Uh, Twenty five dollars. The end total was forty five dollars. Damn. But you look, it's a smaller venue. Like I love the Observatory. It's great, a great, great venue. venue. Yeah. yeah. Anyways, uh, also in trouble with the law recently. Can you guess? That's Elon Musk. Oh. Uh, specifically, he's in trouble with the SEC again. And this time for something completely unrelated to his tweets. Here's Reuters. The U.S. securities regulator is investigating Elon Musk's role in shaping EV maker Tesla's self-driving claims, Bloomberg News reported on Friday, citing a person with knowledge of the matter. The review is part of an ongoing Securities and Exchange Commission probe of the company's statements about its autopilot driver assistance system, the report added. SEC officials are considering whether Musk may have inappropriately made forward-looking statements, the report said, without specifying which specific statements or activities by Musk attracted the regulator's attention. Yeah, so the SEC isn't saying just yet, <laughs> but what spurred this move was almost certainly the news that Tesla's director of autopilot technology revealed in a lawsuit deposition last year that a 2016 video from Tesla promoting its self-driving technology uh, did not actually involve any self-driving. It was just a pre-programmed GPS route. Um, he also said that the video involved multiple failed takes where drivers had to take over and one take where the car crashed itself into a fence. But that's not what you saw. <laughs> what you saw was the future. Well, luckily it was just uh, a fence. The Tesla guy argued that the point of the video was to show what Tesla cars will be capable of, but the video very clearly marketed this as something they were already fully capable of when they were in fact not. And more recently, Bloomberg dug up some emails showing that Elon Musk himself oversaw the video's production, editing, and release. So it's probably that. They've yeah. got him on record being like, yeah, just lie. Like, you know. Yeah, even and even publicly, just... The technology uh, will catch up with the app. Publicly, the keynotes. Like, yeah. all of the various keynotes. And it's like reeks of, I forget what company it was that built, like, tried to do one of the first EV semis. But, oh, uh, Rivian? Or, uh, no, it was uh, Nikola, I think. Yeah, and they just, they filmed it, but they just put it on a hill? <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. They just put they it on put a hill it on, and they put, put it in on neutral. A, a slight incline, and then they just, like, they tilted the camera. Dutched their camera angle a little bit, like, wow, look at it go. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're like, you can't do tier. that. If your car doesn't fucking work, you can't post a video showing it working. There's literally an when American you're Greed episode company. about that yeah. about that thing. It's wild. Uh, also, recently, the 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 guy that was driving where his steering wheel just came off of the Tesla. Yeah, I saw that. Uh, <laughs> but on the other hand, a man tried to kill himself and his whole family by driving off a cliff in his Tesla, and they all miraculously survived. So who's to say whether there these you cars go. are good you or bad? You get the bad and the good. Yeah. The human driver took it over the cliff. Yeah, so there you not, go. Uh, yeah, that was that was all human, uh, not human error. It was on purpose, but. Uh, yeah, the fact that it's, it fell like 150 feet off a fucking cliff and everyone lived. So uh, I think that like with like no care of of anything related to the family safety other than uh, make car good. Like Elon's response to that was just like thumbs up. That's quality. That's yeah, safety, like, baby. A man tried to murder his whole family. Can't do it in one of my cars. Yeah, I guess not. You have to let the car do it. <laughs> 
But anyways, over in Twitter news, despite all of Elon's cost-cutting measures, which range from auctioning off old office supplies to just not paying rent at multiple office locations, Wired recently uncovered one untapped financial resource for Twitter. Potentially hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of equipment, mostly company laptops and cell phones, that Twitter has neglected to retrieve from the thousands of employees that were fired in the past few months. These devices were remotely locked, so they're useless to these former employees, but most of them aren't in any rush to return them unless they're specifically asked to. And most of them haven't heard a peep. Yeah, um, they, they probably fired the person whose job was keeping track of all of the equipment they were loaning out. Oops. So, uh, Oops. But uh, yeah, whoops. But yeah, there's some money there. If you just, you got to figure out, you got to find the Word document with uh, the spreadsheet that actually tracks all this stuff. But that's on one of the laptops that's probably locked down in someone's house now, so what are you going to do? We'll figure it out at some point. Just throw all that shit in the dump. Once Twitter is back to being a $50 billion company, we'll get people on this. Any day now. Uh, in other Twitter news, they have been, of course, unbanning all sorts of unsavory accounts since Elon took over, mostly of the right-wing extremist variety. And last week, Twitter unbanned Nick Fuentes. Hmm. This is the guy who most recently teamed up with Kanye during... Kanye's wildly anti-Semitic media circuit. That's, for the average person, that's all Nick Fuentes is known for, is seeing Kanye West getting a little bit Nazi-ish and being like, hey, I'm going to hitch my wagon to that. Um, is that your handler? No, that's my enabler. Yeah. Uh, Nick Fuentes is so openly extreme in his views that even most conservatives want absolutely nothing to do with him. So interesting choice, Elon. Mm -hmm. But within less than a day, Fuentes was in a Twitter space praising Adolf Hitler and the Unabomber and making very anti-Semitic comments, aka the same shit that got him banned in the first place. So he was quickly rebanned for the same exact reason that he was banned before. So good job, everyone. But he got 24 hours of marketing. Uh, thanks, Elon Musk. Twitter continues to learn all the lessons that it already learned before Elon came along. Yeah, it's... Yeah, he, he apparently needs to learn everything himself. Yeah. He does not trust the experiences of others. Nothing is true until Elon has verified it himself. Yeah. Well, in related news, Twitter is facing a hate speech lawsuit in Germany over Twitter's apparent failure to abide by Germany's understandably strict laws around anti-Semitism and Holocaust denial. Here's TechCrunch. Although Twitter prohibits anti-Semitic hostilities in its rules and policies, the platform leaves a lot of such content online, even if the platform is alerted about it by its users. The litigants argue, Current studies prove that 84% of posts containing anti-Semitic hate speech were not reviewed by social media platforms, as shown in a study by the Center for Countering Digital Hate, which means that Twitter knows Jews are being publicly attacked on the platform every day, and that anti-Semitism is becoming a normality in our society, and that the platform's response is by no means adequate. So we're going to guess that previously there was a robust team in place to make sure that Twitter was at least trying to comply with the German hate speech laws, but that um, some or all of those people who used to do that were fired for not being hardcore enough or something. Um, Germany takes this kind of thing very seriously, again, for very good reason. Um, you know, all laws are written in blood and no law has been written in more blood than Germany's hate speech laws. So it will be very interesting to see how this plays out. Uh, best slash worst case scenario, Twitter gets completely banned in Germany. That would be hilarious yeah. because I don't think he's going to take this seriously. The same way he's not paying rent to fucking King Charles. Like, just whatever, what's he gonna do? Your mom said it was fine. Yeah. Right before she died. Uh, so. But like again, he has to learn things, uh, you know, by himself. Mm -hmm. And though Germany does have the lived experience of a Holocaust, uh, Elon Musk has not. No, he, but he did live in apartheid South but Africa. But he wasn't in the mines doing the emeralds himself, so he doesn't know. <laughs> you know, uh, he was separate. The, the emeralds just appeared uh, at his house. I don't know who... You buy a mine, they start showing up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, beep, bop, boop, yada, yada, yada. Emeralds. I'm not uh, worried about all the... You know, that's for the engineers or whoever does yeah. anything. But, uh, yeah. Hopefully, things don't go very badly. But uh, Elon seems dead set on learning his lessons in person. Yeah, turns out, you know, free speech, just unfettered free speech. Um, turns out there are some issues with this. I could have simply consulted the long record of U.S. Supreme Court cases about these very issues uh, well, to have a more nuanced, uh, you know, opinion on this. But I decided to ruin an entire social media company to figure it out for myself. It, it's it's funny because, I mean, it, not that it isn't this way now, but, you know, social media websites for years uh, enhanced 
uh, the most extreme content because it got the most views. Uh, and I wouldn't be surprised if like Elon came in and he's like, why'd someone turn this spigot off? Well, we could double our views by just, uh, you know, moving the goalposts a little bit, you know, a little bit and see how it goes. And mm -hmm. then, uh, well, what everyone thought would happen actually happened. And uh, he's getting more and more anti-Semitic shit uh, on the website. So, but more views, probably. So he's probably uh, doing that, uh, that dance right now. Views of you. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that's our show. Um, if you haven't seen a previous episode this week where we talked about some very strange goings on at the Dallas Zoo, which update, I believe, in a closet? I believe at least one of those monkeys was found hiding in a closet. Mm. So that's, Ross Geller's closet. That's cool. Yeah. Um, also, Weekly Weird News, where we uh, Martin Shkreli's back in trouble with the law. So Yeah. So check, love to out, see it. check out both of those videos. They'll be up right over here. Uh, Dallas Zoo, Weekly Weird News. Check them out. If you're not subscribed to the channel already, do it. Do it. Leave a like. Let's get to 10,000 likes. Stop being a coward. Do it. Go back. If you missed a like on an old video, you better go back and like that like video them all. right now. Like them all. That's your homework. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.